Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this recommended to come video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with GV device IDs. GV, of course, stands for GeForce Volta, and four specific device IDs have popped up on the internet. We have, of course, heard of various GV IDs aside from GV100 multiple times before. Perhaps one of the biggest examples of this was from the application HW Info. So let's quickly go through the device IDs that uh, laptop to video to go has listed. So we are looking at the NVIDIA GV102, which has the device of 1E07, then uh, 1E3C equals GV102GL, 1E87 is NVIDIA GV104 GeForce GTX 1180, 1EAB equals NVIDIA GV104M. Now we can immediately make a couple of predictions right there. GV102 is most likely GV100, but just has some concessions. So most likely we're looking at lower number of CUDA cores, probably lower number of tensor cores, and Bob's your uncle. The GL1 is, well, probably going to be Quadro based. The 1181, well, I'm pretty sure you know what that one is, and so on and so on. So there is a great deal of predictability if we look at this list. These rumours have not popped up from an official channel. Instead, what the, what the website laptop 2 video to go have done is, is simply go from the rumours that have already been circulating and post them, and then people are taking this as like some type of official leak or whatever, and obviously the internets are starting to do their thing and run wild with it. So we are left with some questions. First of all, is Turing even going to be the name of the architecture? One of the reasons we said yes, it definitely is, is because NVIDIA pretty much celebrated his life on Twitter, and it gave us a good insight to say, hey, well, maybe they're dropping some hints there here. There have been some other reasons as well, and when it comes to the 11 series and its naming conventions, Lenovo's representative did hint that yes, the next generation of GPUs is indeed going to be the 11 series. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily confirmation. In fact, NVIDIA could have told Lenovo, yeah, well, you know, we haven't actually figured out the name yet. And so the representative just said, well, you know, 11 makes sense. I'm just going to say 11 for sake of argument. And if it happens to be called the NVIDIA, you know, 52 series, then so be it. The 7 series will also support up to the 1060 at this time. And then when the 11 series become available, we have time to market with the 1180, uh, up to 1180. So. So that is also one particular possibility. When it comes to the GPUs, almost certainly we're going to be looking at some changes compared to the variants that we're seeing uh, for the server market, HPC. We're going to obviously be seeing fewer tensor cores. We're going to be looking at floating point performance for, let's say, double precision cut down and so on and so on. And almost certainly HPM2 is not going to be a thing. We're going to see GDDR6 with between 256 and 384 bits of memory bandwidth, depending on possibly the part and pricing and so on and so on. But there are a lot of conflicting pieces of information now with these GPUs, and honestly, it's getting to the point where it's actually getting rather confusing. Personally speaking, I don't think we're going to be seeing a Pascal refresh. That was one rumour that seemed to be going on and on and on and on, but I don't think that's going to be the case. I personally think that and it's going to be some variant of Volta. However, to me, the question is, what are the differences? It's possible that NVIDIA just internally are calling the variants of Volta that have, let's say, the tensor cores cut and double precision cut and whatever other changes, they are simply going to call those GPUs Turing. But essentially, the GPUs act and feel and very much are Volta, just with those cuts. That could be one of the ways to go, but ultimately no one really knows for certain right now. Now let's move over to the next generation Threadripper, specifically the 2990X, which of course is based on the, the Zen Plus micro architecture. Now this processor is actually a behemoth, 32 cores, 64 threads, 80 megabytes of total cache, uh, runs at 3.4 gigahertz on the base clock, 4 gigahertz for turbo, although uh, with precision boost, it can go up to 4.2 gigahertz, but with only a single thread, 
It is absolutely monstrous in terms of performance and it is also going to be rather expensive. The website Canada Computers is having this processor available for pre-order at 2400 US dollars, which is, well, bloody expensive as that works out to about 1800 US dollars, which is considerably more expensive than what the 1950X debuted at. But you have to take into consideration a couple of things. First of all, the clock speed increase, but also the sheer amount of cores. 32 cores, 64 threads. Sure, it does have some bandwidth concessions compared to Epic. It has not as many memory channels. It only has quad channel memory, but even so, this thing is not for perhaps even casual content creators. This thing is not necessarily for someone who wants to do a bit of streaming on the side of gaming. This is not necessarily for that. This type of processor is capable of so much more. You can do everything from professional uh, video encoding and 3D rendering. And I wouldn't even be surprised if this set of processors is actually popular with perhaps even SMEs because this type of processor could be really handy for folks who want to do virtual machine environments. Now, yes, of course, once again, it doesn't have the memory bandwidth, but it does have an awful lot of PCIe slots available to it. So for certain workloads, this process is absolutely monstrous and represents really good value for money compared to Epic. It is considerably cheaper than Epic, and obviously the motherboard themselves are also reasonably priced, especially if you get the first generation board. You load that thing up with 32 or 64 gigabytes of RAM, and by golly gosh, you have got a really nice work machine. You could, for example, if you so desire, also have this as a highly configurable workstation for multiple people. So for example, you could give one person eight cores, you could give someone else 12 cores, you could give someone else the remainder, and, you know, depending on the workload. So, for example, if person A today is only doing a little bit of image editing, you can assign them like, let's say, eight cores. And if it's got more than enough performance, you can assign them eight gigabytes of RAM. Or you can say, no, you know what, on this virtual machine, he only needs like, uh, let's say, four cores today because all he's doing is... Um, let's say, posting articles and doing a little bit of updating on WordPress and that type of thing. So it doesn't really need the extra performance. But on the other hand, Susan over there, she needs a lot more cores because she's doing some 3D modeling or perhaps some CAD work. And it's really, it's going to be really flexible for SMEs, yes, and small business environments as a whole, but also, once again, for professionals, for people who want to have the absolute gargantuan amounts of performance, this processor is absolutely a bargain. Of course, we're also going to see the introduction of other processors, and uh, we've seen the 24 core, uh, 48 thread processor. So AMD are really on a winner here. Of course, these are more Halo products. These are not pro products necessarily aimed at everyone, <laughs> and that is putting it rather mildly. But still, I'm not surprised at the pricing. I mean, assuming this price does appear to be accurate, which I think it probably will be, uh, you know, just a sheer amount of cores, it's not surprising the down thing is so expensive. And now we're going to finish the video with some good news, and that is that memory prices may start to decline. As soon as I say the word memory prices, you immediately think of the inflation that's happened over the past couple of years. GDDR5, DDR4, all the memory in the world basically has just gone crazy. But the good news is, according to a report at DigiTimes, it is now starting to get to the point where we are actually keeping up with manufacturing speeds of memory. But the good news is, according to a report over at DigiTimes, we are actually at the point where we can start to produce enough memory and we might even get to the point of oversupply. The DigiTimes report says recent DRAM capacity ramps by Micron Technology and planned kickoff of commercial production by China-based uh, Fujin Jinhua Integrated Circuit in Inontron memory could lead to oversupply for memory in 2019. This, of course, means that companies like SK Hynix and Samsung will also most likely need to lower their pricing to keep in step with this. To give you an idea of how much of a profit DRAM manufacturers have actually made, the margins on DRAM, according once again to DigiTimes, has been 50% in 2018, which is considerably more than what it was in 2016. End of 2016, the profit margins were just 20%. So that is massive in business, to go from 20% profit margin up to 50%. So obviously this is really good news for us as consumers. Hopefully, this will mean that the GPU prices will not be too inflated when NVIDIA releases the next generation of cards, because 
well, it means that they won't have to worry so much about supply and demand. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.